Hello. I'm wearing the sweater. Uh, I put up a short, I think I put up a short a while ago of when I got this in the mail, like around Christmas of 2023. Uh, I haven't worn it in a video yet. This is the first video I'm wearing it in. So it's just, I, I love it so much. It's so nice. It feels so comfy. I want to tell you about Hasdorff Dimension today. Uh, I want to tell you first about like the intuitive thing, right? So the goal of this video is to talk about Hasdorff Dimension and build it up via these things called gauge functions. And I want to motivate it. So in analysis, what we want to know is growth of things, um, I guess is one of the ways you could put it. So um, if I go ahead and scale an object in Rn, how does that thing grow? And so in Rn, usually this is formulated intuitively by just like how things scale, but you can talk about this in other metric spaces as well. So the idea is just comes from a myriad of examples. So if we go ahead and look at a line segment and uh, you go ahead and stretch that by a factor of two, then you're going to get two copies of that line segment. It is quote unquote, twice as long. If you do the same thing with a box and you scale it up by two, you're gonna get four copies of that box. In particular, there is four times the area. And then lastly, if you go ahead and look at, say, Sierpinski's triangle, and you go ahead and scale that up by a factor of two, you're gonna get three Sierpinski's triangles, which is three times the stuff. Uh, it's not really area, it's not really length, but you're, the scaling property is that you're getting three times as much of the stuff there. So what is going on with that? So there are two things happening here. The first one is that we're changing the dimension of the object that we're scaling in some sense, like in the naive sense, right? So if you go ahead and look at a line, we naively say that that is a one dimensional object. You scale up that one dimensional thing and that's what we're doing in that first example. In the second example, we have this two dimensional box and we're scaling up that two dimensional box. And then in the last example, uh, the thing that you want to say, or the thing that you should hopefully want to say, is that the object that we're scaling should be a log base two of three dimensional object. And well, why does that make sense? And then the second thing that's happening is that we're changing our measure. We're changing the way that we are measuring the object, right? In the first example, we're using length. In the second example, we're using area. In the third example, we're using something that's not those two things because it's not area and it's not length but we're getting three times as much of it and so before we get into the how we're measuring it we should start with the why we say it's a certain dimension part of the thing which also can be explained intuitively so in the case of the box you can think about this as choosing different measures to apply to it so the first measure that you might want to apply to a box might be just with length, right? So you try to apply the measure of length to a box and you could make a space filling curve that goes through the box and that space filling curve will have infinite length. Uh, in other words, you would require infinitely many segments in order to go ahead and measure the length of that finite box. Another way to say that is that you would require infinitely many segments in order to measure the quote unquote length of that box. And so with respect to this measure of length, the box would be infinitely big. With area, we just get a finite value, which in this case turns out to be the length times the width or the length times the height. However, you're used to defining how area of rectangle works. And then you could go up higher than area and you could say, okay, well, what about volume? How much volume does it take to measure the box? Well, area doesn't contain any volume. So, or at least hopefully that's an intuitive thing that you have in your brain from elementary school or primary school. And so because area does not contain any volume, the volume measure on this box is going to be zero. And so if we do approach it in this naive way of saying that dimension should be a continuous parameter, and we go ahead and look at these types of measures that are associated with each dimension, if we are before two, we should have infinite dimension. And if we are after two, 
we should have zero measure. And so if dimension works like this continuous real value thing, and for each dimension there is a particular measure, we can go ahead and use this observation above to naively say that, well, if you are before two in this parameter uh, of how you're measuring things, then you should get infinite measure on this box. And if you are after two, then with this measure associated to this parameter, you should get zero measure on the box. And there should be this jump from infinity to its actual value for two, which is that you actually get the length times the width at two, which is some finite value, and uh, then that will jump all the way to zero. So there's like this jump discontinuity that achieves a value somewhere in between zero and infinity in the middle there. It might be zero or it might be infinite, but there is some jump that occurs. Right, and so we, we say that something is of a certain dimension when this jump occurs. Uh, and this jump occurs by looking at all of these different types of measures. So we need to make that type of measure more formal. And in particular, associated to each measure, there's this thing called a gauge function. So a gauge function phi from the half-closed interval 0 to infinity to the half-closed interval from 0 to infinity is a function such that phi of 0 is equal to 0, phi is non-decreasing, phi of the open interval from 0 to infinity is a subset of the open interval from 0 to infinity. And then 0 is equal to phi of 0, which is equal to the limit as t goes to 0 of phi of t. In particular, those last two conditions translate to phi of x is positive when x is positive, and phi of x is continuous at 0. The examples of gauge functions that are the most important in this context are the ones that are just your powered monomials. Um, that is, phi of t is equal to t to the alpha power for alpha greater than zero. And we use these gauge functions to build what we call the Hausdorff dimension, and the Hausdorff dimension is going to end up being this correct dimension thing that does the right stuff with objects like Sierpinski's triangle for the cases of this video. To define it, we have to do a little bit of work. First, let xd be a metric space, and phi from half close zero to infinity to half close zero to infinity be a gauge function. Let delta be greater than zero and A be a subset of your metric space. A countable cover of A such that the supremum of the diameters of those elements of the cover are less than or equal to delta is said to be a delta cover of A. Being a cover of a set just means that when you union all of those sets together, you're going to be a superset of the set that you care about. We go ahead and then define this h sub phi to the delta power of a to be by definition equal to the infimum of the set of sums of phi of the diameter of these ci's as i ranges from 1 to infinity such that those ci's form a delta cover of a. There's a few things that are going on here. The first thing is that phi being a gauge function, what gauge functions actually do is that they take this information about the metric and they translate it into this like relevant measure type information. You can think about this more intuitively with the segment and the box. So in the case of the segment, the gauge function is just the identity. So distance is the correct thing to measure with. In the case of the box, the gauge function is going to be t squared or some constant positive multiple of t squared because it needs to take distance information, which is uh, encoded in the diameter of the box, and translate it into information about the area, which we get from squaring length. Next, the infimum uh, that we take over all of these things is going to make this h sub phi to the delta a what's called an outer measure. I don't have enough time in this video to tell you what an outer measure is, and I haven't talked about it before, which means I should probably take some time to do some uh, general measure theory things on this channel at some point. So uh, we'll come back to that in the future. But for now, what you need to know is that the infimum is important from a formalism point of view. It makes this collection of numbers something that is 
a thing that we can do the correct type of analysis with. Once we have all of that down, we go ahead and define then h sub phi of a, which is by definition equal to the limit as delta goes to zero of the h sub phi to the delta of a's for every a within the, uh, the particular Borel sets of x that we care about. Taking this limit as delta goes to zero, this is what makes a measure in the measure theoretic sense. And we call this the Hausdorff measure induced by phi, and we call the h phi to the delta thing the Hausdorff outer measure induced by phi. Now for these special gauge functions, the ones that are uh, phi of t is equal to t to the alpha, or here I'll write down t to the s, we're going to define h uh, sub t to the s to be equal to just h sub s, and that is going to be called the s-dimensional Hausdorff measure. And so now we have this thing that I've said is the Hausdorff me measure, and I want to somehow communicate that it is the thing that is appropriate and will give us the Hausdorff dimension, or this notion of dimension that we've been intuitively talking about for this video. And uh, to do that, we just need to do a little bit of analysis. And in that analysis, we want to show that the graph behavior that we had before happens. That is, you'll have something that starts out at infinity, and then once it hits the parameter that we call the dimension, it bounces uh, to zero, and then after that parameter, it's always zero. So to see this, we can go ahead and just look at a particular case. Suppose there is a parameter S1 for which the S1 dimensional Hausdorff measure of A is less than infinity. So now we consider some S2 that's greater than S1. Then the S2 dimensional Hausdorff measure of A is going to be equal to that limit as delta goes to zero of h sub s2 uh, to the delta of a. That's less than or equal to the limit as delta goes to zero of delta to the s2 minus s1 times h sub s1 to the delta of a. And then because s2 minus s1 is greater than zero, the delta to the s2 minus s1 power, that limit is going to go to zero. So whatever we get out is going to be zero times the s1 dimensional Hausdorff measure of a, which because we said it was finite, is going to be equal to zero. So in particular, if there is a place where it is finite, then there is this jump point that is exactly as we described with the box. And that's what we call the Hausdorff dimension, is that jump point for this s-dimensional Hausdorff measure as s ranges over the positive real numbers. I've told you what Hausdorff dimension is, I did what the title of the video says, so we're good, right? Right? Yes. Uh, so that's that's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and you can subscribe for more math stuff. Um, I usually try to focus on things beyond calculus, um, but are still analysis and flavor. Um, well, that's not always true. Uh, but I have more math things on here, so if you're interested in more math things, you can go look at those. Otherwise, um, you can also leave me a comment if you want to see me cover certain things. But as always, I am Nathan, this one was Chalk, and I will see you next time.